began to give her trouble because she had to spend so much time sitting in front of a computer. She struggled to, to find a way to, uh, to find a coherent organization for, for the data and, you know, that came from all kinds of different areas and situations and time frames. And as the months of doing this wore on, it, became, it also became obvious to me that the, the actual content of the things she was reading began to weigh heavily on her spirit. And uh, we talked about ways in which uh, we could keep her healthy while she was finishing this research. So, <clears throat> Lori is a person that never um, never wanted to make easy generalizations. And she questioned herself constantly about how to accurately and honestly represent uh, her findings. She's a consummate teacher and she's uh, ever uh, mindful of the potential impact of teachings on students. And she's learned from her long experience in First Nation Studies that there are certain um, very delicate or sensitive topics that really require careful consideration in order to minimize uh, trauma for students in the classroom. So at the point where she began to write her final report, uh, the conversations with her, her teacher mode really began to kick in. And she felt a very heavy responsibility to find ways to teach ethically about what she had found without transferring or passing on the trauma of the history of the residential schools in, in Canada. You know, reporting information is perhaps easy, but how, how do we take responsibility at every level for healing about this topic? This question is not new. It certainly has been asked in many forms by First Nations leaders and community members during the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. <clears throat> the question, this question, however, is yet to be answered in any definitive manner, which is perhaps disquieting <coughs> given the fact that one of the pressing recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is that this history be included at all levels in our education system. Teachers like Lori are deeply aware and working on that question at every moment of their lectures, their seminars, their discussions and other presentations. It's a fundamental part of why we care. On that note, I ask you to please welcome Dr. Lori Jenkins. Thibodeau, who may be in the 
Oregon City. Uh, they were assisting me with research, and they were spectacular researchers. And, and it was wonderful to share with them this journey through the documents. Uh, Patricia Geddes, who is a librarian here at EIU, was also invaluable in her support and understanding. Uh, she assisted me in numerous ways when dealing with the material. And I'd also like to uh, dedicate this talk today to my great mother. I'd like to apologize for the title. <laughs> it was very cryptic, and I'm sure you thought it was very academic and confusing. I probably should have said uh, something humorous like, what I did on my summer holidays. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure you all understand that some of the examples and things that I share today are not the easiest to listen to. And I just want everyone to be aware that it is a sensitive topic. And if you're not feeling um, you know, wonderful by the time you leave, it always helps to talk to other people about it. And um, it's important to take some of the rest of these matters. If you'll bear with me, I'm going to uh, move between reading and speaking freely, just because I want to make sure I cover the appropriate details today. Canada's Indian Residential School History recently came to wider public attention with the publication of Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report just this past December. Some of you may know that the TRC conducted its work between 2008 and 2015. That's an almost eight-year effort. Details contained within the six-volume final reports tell us a great deal about the Indian Residential School System. Perhaps most importantly, the reports confirm and enhance the significant and central survivor testimonies, illustrating the collective experience of students within these institutions. In turn, Canadian citizens have responded to the TRC's work with a variety of initiatives, all aimed at increasing wider appreciation and understanding of this history. It's got featured blogs, workshops, cultural events, public lectures, etc. Canadians' efforts to cast a light on this dark history are gaining momentum. Despite these efforts, we face the fact that the history of these institutions is exceedingly complex. The 100-year-plus-old school system, with its diverse staff and institutional vagaries, contributed to the existence of an institutional machine with many faces and many facts. How do we make sense of these so-called schools and what happened to them? Who should be interested in these histories, and to what end? With the release and the archiving of millions of documents and the survivor statements in the new National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, this is the new archive and library that's in Winnipeg, the sheer volume of unprocessed information related to these schools continues to represent a challenge to our collective understanding and action. How and what to understand remains very daunting. So my goal in being with you here today is to share with you my experiences as a researcher and the findings as they relate to aspects of the Canadian Indian residential school history. My comments are my own. I do not represent the TRC, although my findings may be related to the findings of the Commission. I encourage everyone to look at the TRC final reports because they contain invaluable information that was previously unavailable to individuals, to families, and communities prior to December 2015. I want to share with you here additional thoughts that may have bearing on how we might all perceive this history and its significance. The TRC's work is an important starting point to allow us to consider this important history in new ways. So, just to orient you as to what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to begin with a little overview of the history of the uh, Indian Residential School System in Canada. And I have a few small slides to share with you in this regard. After that, I want to get into a more specific discussion of aspects of residential school history. And I do believe that these specifics will help us to understand more deeply why we should concern ourselves in the long term with these historic events. Um, so these are going to be just a few individual slides, and I'll speak to them. And then I'm going to put the slide uh, show on the loop, and these will feature photographs of beautiful sites of Indian residential schools here on Vancouver Island. And so they'll just be looping, uh, hopefully they won't serve as a distraction, but rather as an opportunity for you to view some beautiful landscapes. Okay, these Indian residential schools and their overarching history. As you understand, 
Canadian colonial involvement in Indigenous communities had a very long history. One important aspect of colonial interruption and interference in First Nations communities was the Indian Registry System. And I'm using the word Indian here in its legal sense, and because it's tied up with the word Indian Residential School, uh, which all relates back to a giant statute we have on the books, the Federal Indian Act. So various Christian denominations had for decades offered schooling to Indigenous children in various parts of Canada, east, north, and west. It was in 1878 that Canada's federal government first considered creating and running boarding schools for the purpose of assimilating Indigenous people into Euro-Canadian society. Studies were done of similar Indian schools in the U.S., and a model was devised in these early years where Christian churches would operate the schools using federal funding because the federal government was responsible constitutionally for Indian people. The reform schools and asylums that operated for non-Indian children and for the poor also served as a blueprint for the system of Indian schools that emerged. The first schools to open were industrial schools. The first one was in Battleford, Saskatchewan, the Battleford Industrial School in 1883, followed by the High River and the Coppell Industrial Schools, one in Alberta. Saskatchewan in 1884. The focus of these industrial schools was on teaching trades and farming. The idea was to train Indian children in skills and ways that would allow them to join in the settler society as workers and to Christianize them. Over the next decades, the industrial school model gave way to a residential school model, where children still labored on the school premises to keep the school running, but the emphasis was increasingly on religious instruction discipline, and a very basic level of schooling. The building of Indian residential schools began in earnest in the 1890s and reached its peak in operation in the 1950s. After which a decline began that ended with the last school closing in 1996. The vast majority of the schools were opened and operated in Canada's northwest, meaning the region west of the Great Lakes, on the prairies, into BC, and the Yukon. And that's why I offer you this uh, TRC map here, which is publicly available. It shows the uh, little yellow spots. You may not be able to read the school name from where you're sitting. But you can see that eastern Canada and southern Ontario and Quebec feature virtually no schools. And the vast majority of schools were op operating in the prairies and up into the uh, north. I'll give you a, a little listing. British Columbia had 18 schools, Alberta 26. Saskatchewan, 20, Manitoba, 14, Ontario, 18. And in Ontario, most of those 18 were in northern Ontario towards the direction of Manitoba. And you can kind of see the spread there. So they really were a Western Canadian phenomenon for the most part, exclusively there were one or two exceptions to this. Northern Quebec, at a later time, gained more schools, as did what is now New York and Northwest Territories. There were 12 and 15 men, respectively. This is a, a very basic map uh, showing the location of residential schools in British Columbia. And if you look closely at the map, again, the resolution probably isn't the best, but the vast majority of the schools were in the lower southwest corner of British Columbia, with one or two located in the interior and further north. I'd like to point out that in the Northwest Territories in Northern Quebec, there was a different pattern of residential school establishment than in the rest of Canada. So we actually need to make a distinction intellectually between what went on in the North and what went on in Southern Canada. In the North, First Nations and Métis students initially attended only a few small schools. Only in the 1950s did Northern Affairs create a hostile system which included Inuit youth. The situation in the Northwest Territories was complicated by the Northwest Territories Act of 1927 and its 1906 school ordinance, which placed the territorial commission, uh, the commissioner in control of education and Eskimo affairs. So Indian affairs and its systems were not the only player in the operation of these kinds of facilities. So the North has another administrative structure, another bureaucratic structure, which is different than the Southern schools, and that did affect how the schools operate. I promised uh, to also offer you a very basic sort of literature 
publications dealing with the history of Indian uh, residential schools are now numerous, but they really come from two main works. And I wanted to feature for you this 1996 uh, rather thick monograph by historian Jim Miller. This was the first book to come out detailing the history of Indian residential schools, and I encourage you to read it if you're interested in the subject. Uh, Jim Miller had worked for the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in the 1990s, and as a scholar, he was able to produce a very scholarly and meticulously detailed overview of this system. So this is the first book that, uh, if you're going to look at any of them, uh, it's a good starting point. Following Miller's work, uh, historian John Malloy, who uh, had taught at Trent, he just retired this year, he had also worked with the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, and he uh, published his findings that he had submitted to the Commission also as a monograph. And this book is entitled The National Crime. Uh, and while the is a bestseller, uh, that's because it provides perhaps to date the most detailed, more so than Miller's work even, uh, look at the records that the federal government is holding in relation to the schools. So it, again, provides an overview of this school system over its 100-year period of operation. These books aren't the only ones, though. And a new book has come out recently, in 2014. It's by scholar Ronald Reason. He, in fact, did an analysis of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I kind of feel like I must show this because it's a scathing uh, critique of that particular commission. He has some very important points to make about the shortcomings of the work that the Commission did. And it is part now of the literature that people should know about when, uh, concerning themselves with these histories. Last but not least, I do uh, encourage you to look at the seven volume uh, final reports. And this is the executive summary. If you don't have time to read 6,000 pages of excruciating detail, you can look at the executive summary and you can purchase it in a hard copy, which is much easier to read than on your computer screen, especially for me now that I have a line for staring at the computer. Um, but uh, it, it really is the most recent summative statement on what is now considered the standard uh, in Indian residential school history. So, um, what I want to offer now was just a little overview of the history of the schools. That's the literature. I've seen a map about the geographic distribution of the schools. Uh, what about these schools and how they've worked? Very quickly, in case you're not familiar with some of the key details. How did children enter into this school system or into the, these institutions? Indian children were enrolled into what I'm going to call the IRS, Indian Residential School System, through two main ways. Through the Indian Act, federal statute, and also through the work of social welfare agencies. Starting in 1894, the federal government added a clause to the Indian Act that allowed the government to compel Indian children to attend school, whether day or residential, and especially students that they deemed neglected or not being educated. And they had the ability to arrest and charge parents who resisted submitting their children to this, unless the child was too ill or was deemed to be required at home. In 1919-1920, these clauses were refined and tightened, and the demand uh, of school attendance was exercised on almost all children between the ages of 7 and 15. In order to have parents relinquish their children, school principals were not above having RCMP and Indian agents threaten parents to enroll the children. We must note that this notion of compulsory attendance was not evenly enforced throughout the residential school in history. Department of Indian Affairs officials at times stated openly that they did not want to compel children to attend school. So they weren't really that consistent about the Social welfare agencies, secondly, also provided a portal that uh, saw Indian children enter these institutions. These agencies also circumvented parents. The Child Protection Acts in the provinces, as well as the Federal Juvenile Delinquent Act as early as 1908, allowed children to be picked up. And in this way, the judicial system and children's aid societies were able to direct children into the schools. Uh, just to give you a little example, if you were deemed incorrigible or 
troublesome or a welfare case, no matter what age, this could lead to enrollment in the residential school system at the discretion of officials. So, as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission final report suggests, there are a number of generalizations that we can make about these schools, and I'm sure you'll recognize some of them. First and foremost, this system, these institutions, uh, were racialized. Although this might be too obvious to point out, the fundamental truth of the Indian residential school system was that it was solidly rooted in a racial understanding of Canadian society. We may accept that such a racialized view of society operated in early Canada, but it might be worth re-emphasizing that this view of First Nations was based on a law that is still in existence today. This racial conception implied in every way that Indian children, and actually Métis and Inuit, were not considered equal to, but rather as a burden to other citizens. A second fact about these schools is that they were poorly funded. The federal government routinely underpaid the church denominations for the cost of each student's attendance. In fact, it seems they paid about half of what was uh, deemed a basic cost of a student in any other kind of asylum or institution. We all have heard stories about the inadequate facilities, as a third point. School buildings and facilities were notoriously poorly constructed and maintained. Although they were sometimes new constructions, there was no real standard for their structure. And as a result, they ranged in size and shape, frequently overcrowding children in classrooms and dormitories. Schools were inadequately heated, because of their size, and sanitation was non existence for the large body of residents. Over time, the facilities were not updated to <coughs> meet the basic needs of the students. Overall, the Indian residential school system offered children inadequate living conditions, and that includes food, shelter, and clothing. Poor regulation was another feature of these institutions. It's recognized that the schools were poorly administered and regulated. There was very little, if any, oversight at many of the schools regarding standards of practice in any area of school operation, from teaching to housing to feeding. The federal government admitted in 1968, after 101 years, that there was no standard regulation of the school. Let's talk about education. Well, it's clear that a substandard education was offered. Survivor testimonies and accounts from staff and records demonstrate that what students were offered in the schools had little relation to the education provided through Canada's public school system. Children were expected to labor rather than learn, and resources for the schools were insufficient. Texts, teachers, equipment, all lacking. In addition, children in the Indian residential school system were confronted with an education process that represented an assault on their existing language and culture. The TRC, in fact, has concluded that this represented a form of cultural genocide. A few more points. Obviously, these schools interfered with family relations. Parents and family, including siblings, were discouraged from associating with students. And the IRS system had many ways of interfering with family connections and relationships. Parents could be denied access to their children. And in some instances, children were taken from their families and removed from their region entirely. Healthcare, it was some standard. Although the churches and federal government were the officials, or official guardians of peoples in this system, very few measures were taken to ensure the health and well being of the church. Indeed, church and state were negligent by any standard. Finally, I'll mention the fact of abusive management and disciplinary conditions. Uh, I can add that one of my mandates as a researcher was to investigate punishment and death in the schools. And I'm not going to give any details on this front, but rest assured that abusive management and disciplinary conditions, disciplinary conditions were very, very extreme. In 1969, the administrative structure of the Indian residential school system was altered, and the federal government took over direct control of the schools in southern Canada and began a slow process of closing facilities, in part because of pressure from First Nations. Some schools were even transferred to First Nations control. So the waning of the Indian residential school system from the 1970s through the 1990s was slow and painful for those students who remained in the system. In this phase of IRS history, most pupils remaining in the school system were deemed rightly or wrongly by authorities to be social welfare cases. So, what are we to make of these facts? Indeed, this list of general facts about the schools provides an abstract sense of 
of the dismal conditions that paternalistic and authoritarian approach to indigenous education taken by the federal government of Canada in a hundred year period. Yet, I would argue that these conclusions, as important as they are, promote a rather reductionist understanding of this large system. The existence of these facts do not necessarily aid in our understanding of the larger whole. I, I draw your attention to three things. These conclusions that I've just listed for you, some more than others, actually defy our human understanding because they're not attached to a particular time or place. We cannot really imagine what core facilities look like over a hundred year plus period. We can barely comprehend abuse and discipline in different generations. This is perhaps most true for the early decades of the system, since we have survivor testimonies for the more recent years, which do humanize the experience. Teaching conclusions like this uh, becomes very difficult and even risky, especially to younger generations who don't have the benefit of observing change over time. And these kinds of generalizations really do avoid historicity. Another point is that these conditions, which I've just listed to you, do not really, did not necessarily coexist. They did not always exist to the same degree in the same place at the same time. Therefore, we may get a skewed perception of the nature of the experience of such facilities. It's a bit like watching a montage in a movie where events are sped up and connected in a way that doesn't happen in real time in real life. Most of all, these facts also rely on a comparative standard and a comparative context, which change through time. Again, challenging our grasp of how to make sense of an experience in relation to our own lives. They're also based on an understanding of lack, which is a relative standard. It's not surprising, then, that our minds simply reduce further to one fundamental idea. Bad. It's still work. Bad. Okay, I get it. It is like that. They were bad. But that doesn't help to think like that. So, what I would invite you to consider with me today are another additional set of perspectives on the Indian residential school system. Perhaps these might allow us to connect to this history in such a manner as to conceptualize it in a way that we can connect to it, both on a human scale and locally. I have five points that I want to make to you in regards to your reorientation of your understanding of the system. And this is based on my research of the millions of documents that were uh, presented to me as a researcher for the GRC. First of all, and this is perhaps an easy one, I'd like to uh, invite us to consider that each Indian residential school had its own distinct history of the system, based on its staffing, its geographic location, and the nature of the children who were housed there. And I, in fact, I believe one of the most important tasks that we can undertake is to document the individual history of each school. Let me share some examples of the origins of different schools. Some schools were launched on government initiative. Uh, Fort Francis School, which is uh, in northern Ontario, was built by the old ladies of the Roman Catholic Church to save money through the closing of three day schools that were in the region and they used those funds to transfer students to the residential school. It was a complex example of wheeling and dealing between the church and the federal government to get a school open. So they closed three local schools to create one big residential school. The Shubanakity Indian Residential School was founded in 1930 off reserve. It only operated for 37 years and closed in 1967. It was the first Department of Indian Affairs school in eastern Canada and was built on a farm property purchased for this uh, initiative. The school functioned primarily as an orphanage, and within the year of its opening, the subject to all kinds of protests coming from community members and Indian agents alike about the disgusting and dismal conditions in the facility. Uh, just for example, the facility was built to hold 125 students, but regularly held 175. They only had four classrooms. So you think how many kids were there? Those were government-started schools. Other schools were founded on a church initiative. The Christie Indian Residential School, which is located on the west coast of Vancouver Island, was founded by Catholic priests on Meers Island on, on the hope 
hopes of attracting students. There was no one there to begin with, and they wanted to encourage the faith. Initially, it only had two or three students. Only later was the school incorporated into the residential school system. Another example is the Fort William Indian Residential School in Ontario. It was also an orphanage to begin with, which accepted Native and non-Native children. But gradually, as it was moved into the residential school system, it only served registered Native children. Finally, I invite you to consider the Presbyterian Cecilia Jeffrey Indian Residential School. It opened in 1902 near Shoal Lake in Kenora, and the school was funded by Presbyterian Church's Women's Missionary Society as a brand new school. It was put on a farm, which was purchased by a church for $7,000. Uh, I'd like to point out that the Cecilia Jeffrey Indian Residential School has a beautiful website that they've had up since 2009, and there the community has documented that school from their point of view. And this is the kind of specific research that I think would really benefit us, is having individual schools make connections to their communities, because of course they have a relationship with those communities. Let me offer a little bit more detail on this Cecilia Jeffrey School, so that you can see the difference of knowing more about one. After it was opened by the Presbyterian Church and ran for a number of years, uh, by 1929 they, would, they wanted a new one. And so a new school was built in 1929 using Department of Indian Affairs funds. It was uh, $150,000 to build this new facility, which was quite a change from the original $7,000. It was near a rail station and on a large plot of agricultural land. The description in the record reads as follows. The school is a fine red brick building, two and a half stories in height, with an extension to one side, which is the chapel. The principal's residence also forms a part of the building, with the door connecting it and the school proper. The school is beautifully situated on rising ground overlooking a lovely little lake. All the buildings necessary for carrying on farm work are also on the land adjoining the school. The property includes 168 acres of land, 70 of which are in cultivation. The remainder is covered with wood. The dormitories are large, sunny, and airy. Indeed, that's our all rooms. The school can accommodate 125 pupils. Students came to this school from the Treaty 3 area, and on average there were 158 students in the school at any one time. Well, what was so special about this school? Let's take an even closer look. In fact, the records on this particular school are especially thick for a 10-year period specifically 1929 to 1940. First of all, this was a school that had non-native children attending. In the records it says white children. White children attended the school. And they paid as boarders, and the money went to the school. Second of all, the church had more children attending than they were receiving grants for. In fact, this was uh, the admission of additional students was part of a strategy on the part of the school to keep students away from the Catholic school down the road. The Department of Indian Affairs would not fund these students because they weren't attending the correct denomination. But the Presbyterian Church was so keen to have them that they kept them in there anyway. So the overcrowding was literally uh, an initiative of the church. Early in this decade, the Cecilia Jeffrey School was supervised by a particularly dis disreputable principal. I'm going to name him Mr. Byers, that is his real name. The oversight of the principal was poor, and complaints during his tenure were numerous. The files are very, very thick. Let me give you some examples. The students complained about immorality among the staff. Sidebar, the teachers were sleeping with one another. Police reports extensively on student immorality. The RCMP were called in routinely to investigate student fraternization in the dormitories. The principal himself was often away from the school without appointing any acting authority. The principal had allowed students to act as supervisors in the dormitories of their peers. And indeed, students had skeleton keys to all the doors in the institution. The principal also kept students older than the legal age to have there, uh, 15 or 16 were classic age to graduate students, but he had students older than 16 in the school. Uh, there were students age 18 and 20 there at the time as well. Fighting between students and staff was reported numerous times during Byers' tenure. 
And Byers himself routinely called the police when he had difficulty disciplining students himself. Byers, in turn, was frustrated when police or Indian agents questioned his ability to supervise the school or agreed with students' complaints. The number of beds in the school were insufficient for the number of students when he was principal. The showers kicked into the dining hall. Runaways were common from the school, as police reports attest. Children jumped onto passing trains on the nearby rail line, or they hitchhiked along the highway. When apprehended by police on the principal's request, the students reported that they had been thrashed for nothing. According to a local Indian agent, quote, we have more trouble in getting children back to this school than any other school in the agency. We have also had more friction here. The dismal decade in Cecilia Jeffrey history closed when, in 1938, Byers refused to send a student to a hospital who had whooping cough and meningitis in order to save money. The child died. Eventually, the staff at Cecilia Jeffrey created a petition to have the principal and his wife, who served as a school matron, removed. Mr. Byers, in turn, was working to have the local Indian agent who was investigating and discredited. Principal Byers was relieved of his duties in 1940. So, how was the situation able to continue for so long? For 10 years? And let me tell you, it's, it's every day something happened in that school. And if you look at the file holders, they're thick. In the words of the local Indian agent, I took great care to explain the pre to the Presbyterian Missionary Society that these matters were not up to myself or our department. But entirely a matter for the church, as we did not interfere in the internal management of any of our residential schools. On Vancouver Island in 1946, similar explanations were offered as to why the Department of Indian Affairs would not interfere in poor school situations. The Indian agent said to the principal of the Cooper Island Indian Residential School, As you know, once a child is admitted to a residential school, she immediately becomes the responsibility of the principal. It's not my intention to feature these schools as characterizing all institutions, but simply the role of specific individuals at a specific time and place facilitate our understanding of what happened in those places and what happened to students who were in the care of the state. Indeed, knowing some specific history of the school and its staff gives us insight into the institution and the response of Indian Affairs and its capacity of oversight to these specific conditions. The specifics are very revealing of the power and the authority of the school administration and Indian Affairs at this particular moment. We understand the context of these events, and this gives the details deeper meaning. Until we can have more detailed histories, I suggest we continue with another bit of a perspective shift. So that was my first point. These specific histories really need to be done for us to really get it. Second of all, I think we need to shift our perspective to the idea that Indian residential schools in Canada are not schools. They're not schools in the sense of school in their own time, nor in our time. Although they did have a mandate to offer some degree of teaching and education within the facilities, their intention was to assimilate Indigenous children into a culture that was not their own, and in doing so, dismantle their cultural identity. More precisely and specifically, in a short period of time, a number of these institutions were used and understood as a form of foster care. They were understood as juvenile detention centers and as a source of labor for authorities and by the authorities who manage them. For example, routinely Indian residential schools, at least until the 1950s, frequently operated on a half-day system where scholastic skills were taught in the morning but that the afternoons were spent engaging in manual labor to benefit the facility. Scholarly development was not a priority in these institutions. Let's look at their role as foster facilities. Knowing that the students were enrolled in schools through the Indian Act, and that social welfare agencies uh, also helped with this, we can truly understand that the schools functioned as a system of foster care, where the schools accepted children to foster, and release them to external foster care. This targeting of neglected or deprived children began in the very early years of the university system, as early as 1895. Through its regulations, 
Indian Affairs was able to become the de facto arbiter of which children it wanted access to. The right of Indian Affairs to make such determinations was never clear, and indeed parents and relatives at times did enter into custody disputes with Indian Affairs. Parental consent was rarely sought explicitly by the Department of Indian Affairs. The involvement of formal child welfare agencies, children's aid societies, etc., became increasingly formalized in the 1950s through the 1970s. Let me give you some examples. In the 1930s and 40s, records show that officials actively chose custodians for children. At the Berkeley uh, Indian Residential School in 1937, two young girls were assigned to the custody of a relative by their father. Instead, the DIA assigned the girls to their grandmother, dismissing the written wishes of their father. In a similar case at Fort Resolution in Northwest Territories that same year, the Department of Indian Affairs representative refused a father's claim on custody and wrote that while the department may have no legal grounds for refusing this father's request, at least we have a moral one. At the Fort Francis School in Ontario, records indicate that children were placed in the Indian Residential School by the local children's aid society, with the aid society acting as foster parent. In BC, 1958-1960, children were moved from foster care to Indian residential schools like the Lajau Indian Residential School in North Central BC. In the early 1960s, children were commonly moved into community-based foster care over summer holidays when the Indian Residential School closed for summer break. The records increase in the 1960s where illiterate parents had to sign consent forms to transfer the children to foster care. The signature simply consists of exit. To provide an interesting quote from Indian Affairs around this, they said, We realize that the easiest solution to many of these foster care cases is to relegate the children to the residential school. Placing children in the Indian residential school system as foster care continued into the 1960s and 70s. By the late 1960s, Primary and elementary school children were placed in a residential school rather than foster care. Foster care was reserved for high school students. In 1973, a majority of students at the Alberni Indian Residential School were there in a foster care situation, but other care was available to them. The West Coast Council of Indian Chiefs complained to Indian Affairs, stating, The Department of Human Resources has not taken responsibility for foster placements for our children where these are needed. After all, there is always the good old Indian residential school residence. What about juvenile retention? The IRS institutions also offered authorities the opportunity to detain pupils in their facilities as a form of juvenile detention or correction. For example, children who were deemed difficult to manage or discipline cases were sent to residential schools. This happened in uh, 1965, an example of the young boy being sent to Lajau, BC. In 1956, a young man was detained in the Williams Lake Residential School while he awaited sentencing for a break and enter offense. In the 1960s, a young man was sentenced to report to St. Michael's Indian Residential School at Alert Bay for three months as punishment for his participation in crime. In 1955, a youth was moved from Ocala Prison in the U.S. to the Kootenai Indian Residential School, St. Eugene's, at Cranbrook. There are many more examples, but I'll stop here uh, because many of them are from other parts of the country and not BC. When we hear the word school, we have all kinds of expectations and associations that do not apply to these institutions. Let us view these facilities as institutions, not schools. In this way, we we can go even further with this reorientation. Let me consider my third point here with you. The schools were also not closed facilities. The previous foster care examples that I just gave demonstrate how the institutions operated in concert with children's aid agencies and the police and even surrounding communities to detain and move or remove children from their families and communities. I suggest that in fact, the schools were a conduit, not an end point for children. Additional social institutions were complicit in moving children further away still, away 
away from families and communities and the IR system into new settings. Some children even disappeared, and that's in quotes. I was asked to find missing children as part of my assignment. And indeed, I found that children did actually disappear into thin air. Their names were changed, and they were moved to all kinds of other locations through the school system. The school was really a conduit in that sense. The Indian residential school facilities were willfully utilized and unexamined by some of our most cherished pillars of society, our education, our social welfare, our justice, and healthcare institutions. The Indian residential school institutions were not really a hidden part of Canadian society, isolated and operating outside the understanding of the larger community. But I suggest they operated in a blind spot, or indeed that they were hidden in plain sight. Indian residential school institutions were tolerated as a useful tool within our social welfare system and not viewed as abusive or damaging to Indigenous peoples. The Indian residential school institutions were used as such. Uh, and the fact that they were can be attributed to systemic racism and a widespread social sense of moral authority. I'll give you a few more examples of this conduit role. Hospitals were also part of this conduit system. Children were at times transferred to local clinics or hospitals from Indian residential school facilities if their situation was dire. At this point, the Department of Indian Air Affairs was often keen to discharge the student from the school and reduce their responsibility for them. Children were also moved to be admitted to more distant Indian hospitals. Some of you may know that Canada had a separate Indian hospital system, away from families. And from there, they disappeared. Children from all over the western subarctic and arctic were shipped to Edmonton, for example, to the Charles Hansel Indian Hospital. Very few of them returned home after their stay in the hospital. They were simply moved to other locations, other opportunities, other families. The reverse was also true. In 1945, a seven-year-old boy was transferred from hospital in Vancouver to the Lejeune Indian Residential School on the authority of the physicians who deemed his parents incompetent. In 1947, the record shows a student was enrolled at St. George's School in Lytton, BC, after receiving treatment for tuberculosis. So students were moved from hospital to the schools. Cases show how students could even be transferred from hospital to a detention facility and then to another hospital when there was no room at the Indian residential school. <laughs> Furthermore, reformatories and correction, correctional facilities played a role in this movement. Examples demonstrate that students could be moved all over. In 1945, a student was committed to the Regina General Hospital Psychopathic Ward by the RCMP on recommendation of the school. There was no assessment and no representation. In 1950, a student was sent to the Manitoba Home for Boys after threatening a teacher and attempting to burn down the school. He was convicted in juvenile court without the benefit of a defense counsel. In 1960, a student from St. Michael's at Alert Bay here in the Rockland region was transferred to the Brandon Lake Industrial School in the Nile. Students also became a source of labor, and this was part of their movement. Older students were moved from the Indian residential school system to other jobs or work opportunities, again, away from the residential school facilities and their families who lived in rural settings. These transfers were part of the impulse on the part of the Department of Indian Affairs to have students assimilate into urban Canadian society as workers. Canada's Indian hospital system routinely recruited Indian residential school teens into their facilities as a workplace. There, the students trained as nurses, nurse assistants, lab techs, orderlies, and in various other roles. Young women were recruited into denominational hospitals here on, uh, in our region. A young student in 1936 was taken from Keeper Island Indian Residential School to work as a nurse assistant at the St. Joseph Hospital in Colmont with the nursing sisters. Young women were routinely moved and recruited to serve as domestics in non-native communities, and young men served as farm and hands and laborers. The primary theme of these movements is that agencies in Canadian society worked in partnership to handle the transfer of quote-unquote pupils as they deemed fit. 
The role of parents in decision making regarding the fate of their children was not featured as a priority in any part of the video correspondence. Again, this is the missing children piece. This bring me, brings me to my fourth suggestion for perspective reorientation. This whole system was characterized by a disregard for parental involvement in the lives of those children who were institutionalized. More directly, that in taking over guardianship of pupils, acting in what we consider in a legal sense to be a local parentis, the federal government and schools presumed there was no need for consent regarding the treatment of pupils. We know from the foregoing examples of children that they could enter the new residential school system without consent of their parents, and sometimes without even the knowledge of their parents. Although regulations suggest that the parents would sign application forms for their children entering the schools, the early decades of school operation into the early 1900s, there was a sense that parents uh, should sanction the enrollment, but that such consent was not required if the Indian Act or other laws were brought to bear on the family if the child was being neglected or simply failing school attendance. Application forms were routinely completed by Indian agents and parental signatures were not present. If you look at the application for us, no parental signatures. Furthermore, instructions to Indian agents in 1947 reinforced the idea of the Department of Indian Affairs authority over students they perceived as needy. DIA instructions read, deaf, blind, mentally defective, and physically handicapped children, also children having behavioral difficulties, which require attendance at a special school, may be placed in a suitable IRS institution. Consent of parents is not necessary if the child is committed by proper authorities. The silence regarding consent around student treatment is perhaps most evident in the area of health care within the residential school system. The nature of health care within this system is something that has been poorly investigated, in part because the records are problematic. In many instances, researchers don't have access to private medical records of pupils, and healthcare facilities did not archive patient records in the past as they do today. In fact, there's a huge hole there in the record. Without sharing details of specific medical care examples, it's noted that the overall health of Indian residential schools uh, pupils was compromised by extreme stress as well as poor hygiene, food, and the presence of infections. When it came to treatment of illness, students were left to the vagaries of the school staff. There were rarely qualified doctors and nurses to tend the sick. After 1945, with the founding of the separate Indian Health Services, treatment for tuberculosis and other communicable diseases was controlled by Indian Affairs, and consent was still not emphasized in any other form of treatment. A quote from Indian Health Services administrators reveals the attitudes of the mid 20th century. I do not think that consent of parents for open TB cases should be stressed too much. It should be taken for granted. If left to the Indian, many cases would be refused for treatment, especially if they realize it's their own wishes that are to be followed. Why try for compulsory treatment in our regulations if we're going to leave it to the individual that in many cases is not competent to judge? Even vaccinations, which required consent from non-native parents in the day, were not viewed as reasons for obtaining consent from Indian parents. As a nurse in Duncan on Vancouver Islands, just in 1945, even though it's customary in the white schools to obtain a written consent, it would make inoculations with Indian children very spotty and difficult, I believe. It was so much easier for school staff to act as guardians, and this was supported by Indian affairs. Gradually, a stance emerged by the end of 1961 that principals were responsible for the people's well-being, and that every effort should be made for parents to sign medical consent forms, but that if push came to shove, the principal could take the lead. It was suggested that despite the consent form, principals should authorize treatment without any kind of law. If it is impossible or impractical, the principal may proceed to authorize treatment at his discretion. Enrollment in schools would not preclude signing consent forms by parents, and existing students could take a separate medical consent form home to their parents to sign over the summer, but that doesn't mean they did. Most uh, enrollment and consent forms 
remained unsigned. And in the late 1960s, students were still attending schools without signed medical consent forms. In summary, these examples suggest that, we, uh, that with regard to the issue of consent, the Department of Indian Affairs and its medical counterparts in Indian Health Services were secure in their moral authority to assert control over the bodies of the peoples. So, just to sum up four points, I'm inviting us to understand the specific history of each facility in its own right. And I'm inviting all of us to view these facilities not as schools. I think we need to consider them as foster and detention centers, as well as conduits into other social institutions. And I'm inviting us all to view the facilities as places where families lost parental rights over the bodies of their own children. These points should demonstrate to us the deep investment Canadian society as a whole had in controlling the children in the system. It was a complex interaction between these custodial institutions and our larger Canadian society. What does this mean to us as citizens? By changing our perspective on the Indian residential school system, we can see how Canadian society supported the impulse to, me, to wield extreme forms of authority over specific communities, in this case, indigenous communities. The role of the state in exercising such authority has shifted over time, but it still has not disappeared. We should care about the exercise of this form of control. Furthermore, if reconciliation is a goal in the discussion of this aspect of Canada's past, we need to reconcile ourselves to the fact that we live in a society that sanctioned this on a larger and deeper scale than we perhaps realized. By studying the specifics of this system, I contend that we can come to a better understanding of who we are and what happened where we live. We will better understand those who share our lives in our communities today, the survivors. The beneficence of the state and the church through their social welfare institutions completely overrode the autonomy of indigenous peoples. The help became a force of conformism. The state sanctioned moral imagination. That do-good impulse took all precedence. Even now, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, which is that archive and library in Winnipeg, is asserting the right to share survivor testimonies against the will of the survivors. This is another one of these cases of, it'll be a good thing, but the survivors themselves have other thoughts on that and it's not being listened to. We cannot reconcile until we acknowledge the autonomy of Indigenous peoples. Self-determination is an important solution to the crushing and blind drive to charity. You may wonder what happened to my fifth point in closing. It's related to everything I've said up until now. It should be highlighted for its own significance, and that's why I'm leaving it to the end. I would like to offer to you insights gained from my own work, and that is primarily that survivor testimonies of their experiences in these schools, institutions, I don't want to call them schools anymore, and as documented through the truth and reconciliation process, are generous. Indeed, records indicate that tragic and traumatic events were often worse and more widespread than the oral history suggests. This, in fact, is a result of the reality that those who suffered the most in the schools could not share their experience. It's either too painful to recall or these people have passed on. Qualitatively, the experience in the schools was more negative than recollections may even suggest if the school records are any 